Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. Well, hello, everyone, and hail to you. Welcome back to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, episode two of season four underway. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't yet and you are a fan of this podcast and of Midgard Musings as a whole, I invite you to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow me on all my social media, follow this podcast wherever it is that you get your podcasts from, uh, all of the things that you can do to help engage with the various platforms and stay up to date with all of the things that I do would be greatly appreciated. And if you're looking for a quick and easy place to, to find all of those details, you can click on the link tree link that is uh, annotated down in the description of this uh, podcast and on the YouTube channel here, or you can also go to the show notes and find the link tree link there. But I'm pretty much most on, you know, on, on most of your major social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, of course, here on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, we're just blasting all over the podcast waves today, and uh, so yeah, thank you so much. There's also merchandise that you can buy through Spring. Uh, you can become a patron on Patreon, you can donate to the channel, to the podcast through uh, Ko-Fi, through PayPal. There's, all again, all kinds of ways that you can support uh, what I do monetarily. There's also a really cool thing, is if you are subscribed to me on YouTube, um, all of my short-form content, if you look at the, uh, the title of, of, of the video above that on your mobile devices, if you're watching it on your phones, which I think most of these are, you're going to see a little uh, option for you to uh, buy thanks or, or give thanks or super thanks or something like that. Anyway, YouTube has opened up the option for super thanks, which is yet another way for you to uh, support your favorite content creators on that platform, monetarily speaking. Uh, so if you are so inclined and you want to send some Dinero my way, um, please feel free to do so. Really appreciate that. Um, but yes, today's episode is going to be on, as you can see, regarding something of a uh, somewhat pagan origin. Yeah, I guess it does have some, you know, heathen or pagan background to it. But is it really a true heathen, Germanic heathen specifically, uh, holiday or holy tide? So we're going to be talking today about the charming of the plow, or what is referred to as charming of the plow, at least in modern times, and see, you know, what the heck that is, and and, and if it find you know if it finds its place in any uh, sort of source material. Perhaps we'll we'll get into some of that as well. Uh, before we get into the podcast, though, I do want to call attention to uh, some local things that are happening here in the Middle Tennessee area. Um, so this this mainly. I guess would uh would affect you or impact you if you are, you know, again, Middle Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Nashville, uh, the surrounding counties and areas of Middle Tennessee, or within a close enough proximity, uh, Clarksville, Dixon, Hickman, up in that area, wherever, maybe even some folks in Alabama and Kentucky. Um, but uh, coming up here in a couple of weeks, I believe February eleventh, I think it's a weekend. Uh, there's going to be a more information, again, annotated uh, down in the description and over in the, the uh, show notes of the podcast. Um, there'll be like a, uh, a Middle Tennessee Heathens meetup um, hosted by uh, Greg Strong, who is chieftain of the Raven Moon Hearth, based out of uh, Nashville, Springfield, up in that area. Um, and he's just hosting a, uh, a public get-together at one of the public parks close to in our area. I believe it's the Cannon or no, sorry, Cason. I almost said Cannonsburg Trailhead. Cason, the Cason Trailhead Park. Um, so he's going to be out there for a few hours one afternoon. Again, I believe it's February 11th, so I think it's a Saturday. Um, but anyways, link link for that's going to be down there, so if you're in the area and you want to come out and just, you know, see what the, the local pagans of heathen uh, or Middle Tennessee heathens are, are talking about and doing, come out and say hi. Um, and then in March, I believe Sunday, March 12th, 
there was going to be a, another Middle Tennessee Heathens uh, park moot, as it were, um, at the same location at, at Case and Trailhead. And uh, that is hosted by myself and Greg collectively. We are going to be uh, just hosting, a, again, a, a more of like a lesson, I guess you could say. It is a public meetup, and we want anybody and everybody that's interested to come out and say hi. Um, but it's going to be specifically a uh, sort of like a, a lesson, uh, as it were, of the, you know, um, the concepts or or worldviews, I guess is the best best term for it, of death in the afterlife. So Greg and, Greg and I are going to be hosting that. I'll uh, kind of will be leading that in, in the sense of uh, the lesson. I'm going to be, you know, formulating the lesson, but it's definitely, it, it is an open discussion sort of lesson, right? It's not just here, let's, uh, let's us teach you about some things. It's, it's a combination of that and uh, let's learn together. Let's hear your thoughts on things and, and, and see, you know, where the conversations, you know, migrate to and, and, and all that fun stuff. So some really cool, fun local things happening here in our area in Middle Tennessee. Um, would love to get to know some of the people that are in and around our areas, and hopefully you would like to come out and get to know us a bit. Um, so again, check down in the description. Check the Linktree link. Uh, sorry, the, not the Linktree link. Check the uh, show notes of the the podcast, if you're, if you're just listening to this, there's going to be some, uh, event details. Um, they, they are, uh, again, they're in-person events. Um, there'll be Facebook, uh, events for that. So if you are on Facebook and you want to, uh, keep track of the discussion or things that are going on leading up to those days, um, it, they're, they're, they're public events. So go ahead and click on those. If you're not on Facebook, again, just check the description or check out the, um, Show notes and the dates and times and locations will be will be posted there as well. All right, so now that we've got all that out of the way, and now that you're hopefully all settled in, ready and raring to go for this week's episode, we're again talking about uh, the charming of the plow. And uh, why are we talking about this right now? Well, um, I was having a conversation with um, a gentleman who is actually going to be coming on this podcast in a week f- from today. Um, to talk about some things that, that almost are, that, that, that have some correlation, that have some connection. Um, but this gentleman and I were talking, he, he, he messaged me um, on the Facebook page, which as I've mentioned numerous times be- before, if you guys have ideas or thoughts or just things you want to you know, bounce off of me or whatever, it, you never know, but what might could happen is that your thoughts or your ideas or your suggestions could turn into the inspiration for a future podcast episode, and that's exactly what happened here. Um, so next week, we're going to be uh, having a guest on here talking about uh, a local fella, too. He's, he's um, about 45 minutes or so, within an hour uh, from where I live in, in Middle Tennessee, and he's uh, going to be joining me to talk about um, the uh, com- or, or bringing ag- agronomy back into paganism, you know, um, so the, the focus on what the land can do for us, you know, um, working the land, getting back to a more, you know, homesteading kind of lifestyle or, or again, an agronomist lifestyle of, of growing our, our food and, and realizing the, the closeness that that had to our ancient ancestors where that was something that they had to, to do in order to survive. You know, uh, modern heathens now and, and, and just people in general, you know, our modern society is has grown very far away from that. You know, we rely on uh, just the the convenience of being able to get in our vehicles, you know, hop on public transportation, or even in m- many cases, just walk to the market, to the grocery store, um, to a restaurant, whatever, and just within minutes, you know, uh, within a short period of time, relatively speaking, have our bellies full and our pantries and, and, and freezers and, and refrigerators stocked with food to last us, you know, for, for, for quite some time. And in ancient times, that wasn't ever the case. You had to uh, plan ahead and you had to um, hope and, and, and pray <laughs> that the growing season, the harvest season, was bountiful and that you uh, got good crops during that time, so that way you had enough food to survive and last through the lean times, through the winter months. 
Um, so we're going to be talking again next week about, again, the kind of like the, the application of agronomy to, to paganism or heathenry. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about this thing about charming of the plow. And again, it kind of relates because this time of year, you know, we are getting into the, we're, we're definitely in what you would refer to as midwinter. Uh, for many historical heathens, the celebration of Yol uh, just recently passed with the last full moon. So with that, we are um, gradually moving into what for, again, the pagans of the north in, in, in Scandinavia and in, in the Germanic lands and Germanic countries at the time, uh, would have been the uh, the waning of the winter months and the starting to think about preparing for growing your crops and, and getting the ground ready for planting, you know, for, for the growing seasons, okay? Um, and with this concept or this this charming of the plow, we, we see a lot of Germanic uh, heathens, Norse pagans, have a uh, an inclination to want and uh, or to want to to have some sort of celebration after Yule, um, as as and, and call it charming of the plow. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and and, and get some conversation circulated around it. Now I um, I grew up myself in a very agriculturally focused family. All right. Um, I did grow up, you know, with, with Christian worldviews and, and such, but the, the, the community, the church community that I grew up in was, um, almost Amish in the sense that we were very closed off from the outside world, to, uh, as much as we possibly could and, and be self-sustaining and self, uh, sufficient. We, I worked on a farm for over a decade in my youth, uh, a cattle farm. So we had cattle that we raised for beef. Um, another family in the community raised chickens, so there were eggs available. Um, the Everybody had a garden, you know. Um, the farm that I worked on had a huge garden. They even also had a, a small vineyard where they grew wine grapes, so they were able to, you know, um, make their own wine. Um, shy of like growing grain, like wheat and rye and all that stuff. Like we didn't actually do that. Um, we, we, that, you know, the, the community pretty much had everything they needed. And then everything else to supplement was uh, purchased again through the most uh, authentic and the most untainted sources that we possibly could. So, you know, uh, milk and, and, and that sort of thing. You know, our cattle that we raised were, were all male steers, you know, so we didn't have dairy. Uh, cattle, so we didn't have milk, but there were farms nearby, dairy farms, that we uh, became, you know, familiar with, or that that, that, that people in the community uh, became familiar with to uh, obtain milk before it became pasteurized and homo homogenized, and all of the things that get done in uh, modern markets and stuff now before they go to stores. You know, they they kill off all of the good bacteria and along with the bad and so we would get our milk from those places and before it ever went through those processes and then you know grains for making bread you know we we, we purchased stuff I say we because it was again at the time it was the whole church community but they would purchase things in bulk from uh, quite oftentimes companies that were um, either run by you know the Amish or Mennonites and, and, and things like that so there was again there was a lot of uh collaboration, I guess you could say, with their communities and and and, and at the time ours, right? So I, I come from a background of understanding the the benefit and the the work that goes behind um tending to the land and reaping the rewards of the seeds that you've sown from the land. And I also understand the, 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 the toll that a bad season, you know, if, 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 it, if it was too wet in the certain times of year, if it was too dry, if it was too hot, too cold, this, that, and the other, all these things, um, I get it. I understood, and I, I still understand, you know, the, the ramifications 
the consequences of, of things. You know, if it became too wet, certain crops wouldn't grow, vice, you know, on and on. Well, in, in ancient heathen times, right, like in the, the old times, you know, they, they, they of course, understood and, and, and had to understand that in order to survive. And, and the things that they would do to uh, give them the very best chances of success as possible were, you know, in addition from, you know, working the land themselves and, and, and doing all that, they would in, include and involve their their deities. They would They would pray to their gods and they would invoke uh, protection and, and, and power of the sacred um, as much as possible to, you know, bless the land and stuff, because this is what they needed to, to survive. So gifts were given in, again, in hopes for, for gifts to be received in exchange. So when I see modern heathens now and today, um, just out of, I don't know, maybe necessity feel like, oh, well, because I'm heathen, I have to observe this this charming of the plow thing. Um, I always go back to the why, right? What is the purpose? Why are you doing this? What do you, are, do you actually have gardens that you grow? Do you actually have, you know, land that you toil on and in to produce crops and all that? And if so, then it would make sense to to do something like this when the time is right. So it goes back to, again, the why and the purpose. Um, you got to look back at some of the, again, the, the historic sources. And, and while there is nothing that necessarily is called charming of the plow, there are some things that is uh, at least probably, you know, safe to assume that, that from those, those bits of information that are historically available, that this is where, or that is where this current uh, thing of, of charming of the plow uh, comes. So a plow, of course, is a, is a, um, a, a tool, um, a, a, a farming piece of equipment. And the charming of it, or the blessing of it, is to, again, imbue this agricultural tool that, that literally works the land with other powers of, of, of a sacred nature to involve and invoke uh, the sacred to bless this item, bless the land. Um, so again, it, it goes back to uh, when this was done in the north. So uh, with consideration of a lot of things, like you got to look at um, time frame or how time was reckoned, you know. So uh, at, at one point in time, you know, prior to uh, or, or or after during the during and after the Viking Age, you know, the, how time was reckoned changed. You know, there it went from being you know everybody was was observing the the seasons or observing time uh using a lunisolar calendar so you know from new moon to new moon was a month and and, and the holy tides the holidays were, were kept at full moons you know it went from that to this julian calendar where where when when christianity became involved and in and, and started having its influence and started spreading throughout the north that you know they they kind of went away from that and and then went towards a more uh, specific days of the week, of the month, of the this, right, where, where when holidays and when holy events were to be held. And then, of course, the Julian calendar was switched out to the Gregorian calendar, which is where we are now. And it all got messed up along the way. So if you look back prior to when all of that with, with the Julian calendar and, and all that, even the Icelanders had a, a, a calendar that, that abandoned the, uh, the lunisolar time frames of things and and so you got to go way back you got to or not so far but you got to go back prior to the viking age to know how time was reckoned so in the north when when it was you know midwinter where whenever that yule time happened it, it, it was a time to um look forward to the the the, the time of of growing your crops of planting your seeds Right, it, it it was the midwinter mark, and and now the days are starting. Will start to get longer. There's going to be more sun, which means light, which means life returns, and and that's how the people of the north viewed it. It was that now it's it's not so much about the return of the sun. It was now we can start thinking about planting our crops because it's not as dark anymore, and we got more of this daylight, and now we can 
you know, times won't be so lean. We don't have to ration our food and all that stuff so much. So this time of year in the north, yeah, it probably was starting to get that time where the, the ground was starting to, to thaw, you know, or at least you could make preparations of doing that. And you can look to do things that were uh, going to put you in that mindset of, of growing, your, growing your food again. Um, I remember reading or, or, or hearing about um, uh, one, uh, one source that talked about, uh, I think it was Bede, the venerable Bede, um, who, who referred to uh, the Anglo-Saxons as, as doing things to prepare for uh, the growing season and, and giving gifts to the earth uh, in the form of like cakes and things. So like, you know, what stores of grain, milk, honey, and, and, and whatnot that they had would, was, was a gift back to the earth um, to, again, bless the ground, bless um, the, 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 the spiritual side, the, the sacred side, the, the divine, to give blessings um, to, again, work for a, for a, for a bountiful crop and, and to you know, give them the best chances possible of of growing a good, uh, you know, whatever they were growing. Now, this time of year in, in this part of the country, um, we could still get frost. We could still get snow. We could still get, I mean, anything could happen, especially in Tennessee where I am is, you know, these, these last, uh, and, and, you know, I, I get so frustrated with it because to me it's like it's winter. It's supposed to be cold. There should be snow. There should be ice. There should be, you know, bitter, bitter cold temperatures. And it's, you know, up near 70 degrees here in the last week or two. And it fluctuates. It goes from, you know, some days it's 70. Some days it goes down and it's, you know, in the 40s. And then some days overnight it's in the 50s. Some days overnight it's in the 20s. It's all, it's all up and down. Uh, everybody makes a joke. If you don't like the weather in Tennessee, just wait five minutes and it'll change to something that you do like. So you never know when, when winter is over. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, almost the end of January right now when it should be cold, should I say should, but uh, it's, it feels like spring. So, you know, you're going to get the, the earth is confused. The land is confused. There's, there's, early cropping plants and things that are or early blooming, I should say, plants that uh, are, are popping up, like daffodils and all these other kinds of things that could very well get bolted and, and shocked from a frost or from a snow that happens in another week or two. You know, February and March are, are times of the year when it could, uh, it could definitely go either way. Um, and we've even had times where, it, you know, we've had bitter cold and sometimes snow on the ground as late as April. So you just don't ever know. Um, so I don't know, like in, in, in modern times when I hear again the whys and the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing, like are you really starting to plant crops now? Are you out there toiling the ground? Are you tilling up the ground? Are you digging, you know, the ground up to to start planting your crops? Or are you just doing this because you read some stuff somewhere that, oh yeah, this is the, the time of year. It's always around mid-February or end of January, you know, and we're gonna we're gonna do it because it, you know, that's it, 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 I don't know. It, 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 I get you know. You can do what you want to do. People can do what they want to do. Everybody that 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 listens and watches my stuff, I think, should know by now that you know I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't do or do something, do or do not something, right? Don't do or don't do something just because I say one way or the other, right? If this is a tradition, if this is something that you have, you know, worked into your group practices, into your individual cultic practices, whatever your hearth cult is. Don't let me or anybody else dissuade you from it, um, because if it's worked for you, then 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 there then the proof is in that pudding, right? Like you've proven that it that it works. So if there's a tribe or kindred or individual out here that's you know inclined because they've done it in the past and they've seen good results, I you know I'm not saying that you should change it now just because of what I'm saying. All I'm saying is is consider all of the factors and, and realize that the, this again idea charming of the plow that may not have any early historically uh, based information on it. Yes, sure, there are some things that we could um, uh, deduce that are the reason or the inspiration of why northern pagans, Norse pagans, Germanic pagans, have a inclination to want to do it. Um, I also saw something one time about a, an actual 
um, Old English charm. Um, yeah, sorry, I had to look at it. Acerbot. Um, Acerbot was a charm, an Old English charm, and, I'd, uh, and it was for, like, blessing the, the land, blessing the, the tools of the land, the, to the tools that would work the land, right? Uh, to make sure, again, like you had the best possible results that, that, that could come from it. Um, another thing that, uh, you know, but again, it's Acer Boat, it, not Acer Bloat. Now, I, I didn't want to bring some attention to that. It's, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a a uh, a holy tide. It wasn't a, it wasn't a sacrifice, right? It was, it, was a, it was something that was done in very specific regions with specific people. Um, and again, the Acer boat was a, was a charm, not a sacrifice. There was nothing, you know, uh, killed or, or sacrificed through bloat that would make this a, uh, a, a, a widely celebrated or widely acknowledged sort of thing. It was, it was regional. It was very specific. Same way as the disting around the, the, the springtime months or so, um, in kind of in between the end of Yule and, and the beginning of summer, kind of like when the de sting would happen for the Swedes, um, which, again, very specific. The, the Swedish people had their, their de sting uh, celebration in, 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 in around that time of year before the summer kicked in, uh, just like the, uh, the Saxons had their all thing. Um, if you want to call it the springtime, I don't really think they had this... Uh, concept of, of spring as a season because again it was the far north and it was you know it was either winter and it wasn't winter it was winter and summer you were your two seasons it was light and very much of the time or dark much of the time um so that was the other thing too as i was saying to say is is, is people that want to lump in uh regional uh, celebrations of things just because, oh, it's it's Germanic, it's it's this, everybody should be celebrating this thing. I mean, this thing, uh, which is, again, not the same as this sablot, totally different thing, totally different time of year. Um, this thing was the, the, the Swedish uh, thing for the, for the this year. Uh, or, or, yeah, this year, this was the, like their female um, ancestors. And then the Saxons, I believe it was Anglo-Saxons, had the de bloat in around winter nights, give or take, somewhere around that vicinity. But anyway, uh, going back to the whole like, charming of the plow, again, it, it, it so happens to fall around this, this time of year, the, the, the waning of winter into the start of, of spring. And, and, you know, so again, my whole thing was like, all right, well, if, you, if we as modern pagans and, and modern heathens trying to revive or, or practice old ways in modern times... What sense would it make to have the uh, a ritual or, or have any sort of celebration or have any sort of thing, do any sort of thing that had to do with charming agricultural tools, blessing the ground for crops and stuff until it was actually time to start planting? Now is way too early for us to be thinking about stuff like that for most, for most of us, at least in this part of the country. Um, cause like I mentioned before, you know, you could get snaps of cold weather that, that just kill or shock or bolt whatever potential growth that could come because of these unseasonably warm days and, and all this stuff, it, you know, the, animal, you could see it like it's some days you go outside and it just, it sounds like spring feels like spring, you know, that, that warmth of the, of the air. It's like, this doesn't feel right. And if we feel it that way, if it makes us feel that way, then you gotta you gotta think that it you know nature is feeling the same way. You know, it's just maybe a bit confused and just something's off, right? Um. So again, look like I know some people that are that are actually getting into the mindset of doing a charming of the plow or or a, you know something equivalent to that. You know, here in the coming weeks, and again. If that's your jive, if that's the thing that, that you have, have worked with your group or your collective or your individual cultic practice, whatever. If it's something that you've been doing and, and 
now you're, you know, hearing what I'm saying and, and questioning it, not to stop you from doing it. Again, if, if you've been doing it and it works, then I say continue doing it. But just the purpose, the why. If, if you're new coming into heathenry, if you're thinking about, well, how can I, you know, implement this into my life, maybe you don't even need to because it's not even a thing for, for most... <laughs> of the of the of the larger collective it was it was done with specific people in specific regions for specific reasons um and it wasn't even called charming of the plow like i said there was there was things that happened in in things that were documented that probably all collectively combined led to the inspiration the inclination of this and then I've read some other things too. Again, if you look up Charming of the Plow online, you're gonna find I'm gonna put some source, I'm gonna put some uh, links and stuff for sources down in, in the description and in the show notes of this podcast for you guys to check out at your own convenience and in your own time. But yeah, you know, you, you you'll find all kinds of things that says, you know, it 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 falls in line with the Wiccan uh, celebration or Wiccan Sabbath of of Imbolc, you know, and, and again, that has nothing to do with Germanic heathenry at all whatsoever. Um, I've seen some other things. Um, that suggests that this was entirely a, a, a you know Celtic regional practice or Celtic thing and, and has nothing to do with the uh, Germanic Northern traditions at all. Um, so again, you know, do your own research, find your own things. But from what I've found and from what I've researched, um, nothing specifically that says this was ever even really truly done. It was just there were certain things done by certain people at certain at a certain time of the year that led into this uh, tradition of what it is now. Oh, I mentioned this thing earlier. Um, I believe that Swedes still have a uh, a, a a celebration um, that they that they hold annually um, near this time of year, at least close to it. And uh, if it's a specific calendar date every year, um, but I believe that they still have something around like February, March ish, or whatever that uh, still commemorates the. Uh, their their ancient traditions of of this thing in this time of the year. So then I got to thinking, you know, well, you know, maybe you're not a, a farmer, maybe you're not agriculturally inclined to ha- grow your own crops, but you want to have something, or you you are having something, or, or a group is having something that, you know, maybe points more to the metaphysical side, not just the physical agricultural side, but the metaphysical, right? Oh, we're you know, getting into the time of year, which puts us in a frame of mind of brighter days, longer, longer days, um, fertile days, right? We, we've passed the time of year of, of, of stillness, of dormancy, um, of stagnation, and now we're moving into, you know, this, this, this time of year of growth and of newness and of vibrancy and all this other all these other types of things that you could, again, put some, you know, uh, uh, thoughts or ideas on the metaphysical side of things. So, you know, I think a lot of people get, and it, it, that's, that's 100% UPG woo-woo type stuff where, you know, if you want to involve uh, some of this stuff and then incorporate that, the, the those ideas into the more metaphysical side of things, like, oh, now we're, you know, we, we've, I don't think there's anything wrong with that because myself and, and, and some of the, people that I have in my tribe, you know, we've, we've, uh, we, we've taken the ideas or the, or the concepts of, of certain, um, literal holidays like Sigurblot. I'll just use Sigurblot as an example. I mean, like none of us here now in modern times are, um, sacrificing to Odin for victory in warfare because we're not going to, you know, sail across an ocean and raid another country because, you know, the winter months were rough and we got to store up our stores and we got to, you know, increase our riches. We're not doing that. So we're not celebrating Sigurblot for victory in the sense of that. We are, we are celebrating and, and, and doing what we do in our ways for, for other victories and for other sorts of things, or at least that we have in the past. So, um, Again, the, when, it, when it comes to the purpose, the reasons why, you know, you can have all the intent in the world behind what you're doing, but if you don't understand the purpose or the reason why it is to be done, um, then it's, it's, it doesn't I don't feel carry as much value. It doesn't have as much importance. It doesn't carry as much weight. Um, and so, you know, you could just be going through the motions that are 
you know, helpful for learning and, and you, you know, you can get all that educational aspect of things out of it. But what it was done for or things like it, what things were done for back in the day, they had a purpose, had a very specific purpose. Because if they, if they weren't done, it could mean the difference of surviving another winter or dying before the winter was over. You know, that was, that was the harsh reality. And that's, again, the reason why things were done. They had a purpose behind what they were doing because if they didn't, there were consequences and there were ramifications, at least so they believed. Right? So um, I'm very excited to, you know, think about next week's conversation coming off of, of this one because I feel like it's going to, we're going to take some of the information that I, that I had shared with you guys today about, you know, charming of the plow and, and, and getting ready to start planting crops and, and, you know, doing things that are preparing the earth, preparing the ground for being able to grow crops and then grow your food. And then we're going to do next week talking to somebody who wants to bring the agronomous nature of, of, of what he's doing in, back into paganism and or, or reintroduce it. I guess it's never really gone away, but, but really try to, I really try to uh, awaken that that aspect of our of our different varying beliefs and and get people start talking about it at the very least. You know, um, I did have a conversation with him earlier this week that uh, really inspired me to you know think about ways of of incorporating that to to any degree on any scale. You know, I'm talking about down to you know if you don't have a large piece of land to to grow you know, a full size eight by 10 garden or larger, you know, like, what can you do? You got pots, you got small window, uh, gardens, you got, you got ways of being able to do things, even in a, uh, a, an urban setting or, or a inner city type setting. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. If you know what the purpose is behind what you're doing, then you'll make it happen. Um, you find a way, you make a way. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was what I wanted to, to talk about this week. I didn't have, a, again, a great list of source material that I'm going to read from because that can get to be a bit boring, I guess, if you're just listening to me recite other people's sources. But there are going to be a lot of other links for you to go to and, and stuff to at least start if you want to explore this a bit more. Um, it's going to be annotated in the description and, and in the, the show notes. Um, so just again, recap, there's going to be a couple of upcoming events here in the middle Tennessee area around Murfreesboro, um, and, and those surrounding areas. So definitely check all that stuff out. And if you're close enough and want to come out and see what it is that we're conversating about here in this area, definitely feel free to carve out some time. Very informal, you know, it's usually just a bunch of people just meeting at a park and you know, just having some some light conversation, talking about whatever topics can come up. Um, and if you are in the area and you want to have a, a, a conversation about something specific, you can uh, throw those ideas out there in the event page or, I don't know, just post it wherever you can find it. Um, so that concludes today's episode. It wasn't a very long, in-depth one. Uh, I guess I would just like to you know, give you guys something to think about on if you're doing anything for Charming of the Plow, what it is that you're doing, right? Why do you do it? What is the purpose behind what you're doing? I would challenge you all to think about that instead of, well, we're just doing it because, you know, the last two years or three years, it's just something that we we do and we just go through the motions. Do you get anything out of it? Do you see an actual benefit to it? Have you, have you, just again, gone through the motions just because, or is there an actual purpose? And if so, what is that pers- purpose? Because um, I would personally love to hear it. So if you do have any things that you guys are planning on for for Charming of the Plow or the upcoming, you know, growing months of, of the year, then uh, feel free to share either down in the comments or right into the podcast. You can email MidgardMusingsTN at gmail.com. You can call into the Midgard Musings hotline. That number is 615 615- Six seven one nine eight three two. Um, you can DM me on Facebook or Twitter. Or, um, I don't get messages on Instagram because I don't really keep track of that platform very closely. So you can DM me on Facebook or Twitter. 
Um, and I like, you know, like I said before, you never know but what messages you send me. Uh, you know, they could end up as, as, as future inspiration, you know, for additional content and get you on the podcast and we talk about it, or I just simply mention it here and ramble on for, you know, 30, 45 minutes to an hour. So looking forward to hearing back from you on this topic and looking forward to seeing you back next week as we talk to uh, my next guest about agronomy and, uh, you know, it, it, the, its incorporations into paganism as a whole. Um, so until we all talk again, hail to you. Thank you for your support. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it around. May the gods continue to notice you. May your ancestors smile upon you. Ah! <laughs>